Hit it. Instagram Live. Is everybody cool that they're on Instagram Live today? If you're acting up, I'll call you out. Um, so every, does everybody know about the Alma Shapiro Prize? Uh, for you new people, um, I guess it doesn't matter because John Brogy got it, so you're going to have to wait two more years. But it's just uh, this wonderful prize that you can stay in Rome for three months, and I was fortunate enough to, to get it last year or a couple years ago, I'm not sure. And so I was uh, in Rome with my wife um, last October to December for three months, and you stay at the American Academy of Rome, and they put you up, and they feed you, and this and that. It's a, it's a great place to be. It's fantastic. Um, then after that, we moved to Florence for four months. Um, but this is my first time in Italy, and so that, and this was maybe a year after I graduated school and this and that. But anyways, it's my, the first time kind of seeing a lot of this artwork in person, and, I, and it's so valuable to do an experience in person. So if you guys ever get the chance to go to Italy or wherever your favorite works of art are, I definitely suggest you go. Um, this is a drawing I did when I was maybe a month or so in, a month and a half or something like that, I was just so enthralled with everything I was seeing. Like, and I just could not believe it. The ruins, the, the artwork, the Vatican, seeing Raphael's School of Athens, I remember was really fantastic. Um, so here we have kind of two impassioned artists, you know, amongst these ruins. As inspired by uh, this Paranese print. Um, but it really kind of sums up what it was like to be there for me. Like a kid in a candy store, I guess, would be the analogy, more or less. Um, although not candy, but like a knowledge store. Does that... N not sure if that translates at all. Um, anyway, so... Uh, do you, have, you don't have that pointer, Eric, do you? Sorry, I know. Uh, uh, that's all right. You, you, you don't, I don't really need it. Um, uh, here's the Pyrenees. Oh, I can do this one. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so the composition is sort of broken up into kind of this half, and then this half over here. We have the Pantheon in the back here, the, the Column of Trajan base over here. Uh, I think this is maybe Augustus somewhere over here. We've got various casualties of war down here, the standard Romulus and Remus. And so at this time, I was trying to learn about the history of Rome, knowing the emperors and this and that. And the chronology sort of really helps as you're walking around the city. You see that the city is, is just really built on ruins and they continue to build on it today. Like they just build over the old stuff or they recycle the old stuff and just continue to use it. Um, here's a Piranesi print that I was looking at with this kind of cloud of smoke running through the center, dividing uh, it in half. And this is full of antiquities. This is kind of like a frontispiece for uh, a portfolio of drawings, engravings uh, he did about Rome. Um, here's one. And while I was there, the I printed out all these Piranesi um, co photocopies and laminated them, and they really became my uh, my way around Rome, like sort of like my map around Rome, sort of looking at these prints and trying to find out where these sites were in person. Um, and Pernese, his teacher was Giuseppe Bassi, who was another engraver. But you can totally see it has a much different style. And we're gonna start here at uh, Santa Maria Maggiore, which is an ancient basilica. And I spent, definitely spent a lot of time in churches. They're open, they're free, they're full of artwork all over the place. Um, See, so has such a drastic sort of atmospheric effect. He's more of a painter, I would say. Um, this is kind of more the typical kind of engraving you would see. Uh, this is Santa Maria Maggiore here. It's a fourth century church, uh, burned down later, built in the fifth century. Uh, facade is Fernando Fuga, very Baroque. Here's the rear of the church. This uh, Paranese print. Another th cool thing I just want to point out, just talking about composition and that, is just, 
how he really exaggerates the size and the scale of everything. You can see these uh, two domes on the transept um, are just very massive as well as the bell tower here compared to the, the Vasi print where everything is kind of much as you would expect them to be kind of more topographical view, kind of what you would see if you were there more or less. More or less. Um, and here's my offering. Um, actually one of the few buildings that I kind of spent a, lo a longer amount of time on it, but yes, yeah, I, I started it while I was in Rome and then finished the composition when I was uh, back in the studio. Um, and one thing I was super interested in is just kind of the stories and the history of everything, right? You know, being from America, I guess things are old, like our nature is super old. It's just as, as old as anything, but the built world is may maybe not as old. And so it's really cool to learn about things that were from the fourth century or the fifth century and beyond. And so the figures in this kind of tell the history of the church as I came to learn it. Um, one of the thing that the church boasts is the relics of the manger, right? So here we have a reliquary, um, which is sort of like a shrine that in that encases um, like actual relics. So like within this reliquary, there are little pieces of wood that are supposedly from the manger. And every church has all types of these things, whether those are actual pieces from the manger or not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the reliquary is usually designed to depict the thing that it, that it is holding, right? For example, here is um, from Santa Croce, this little cross here, holding the pieces of the true cross, right? So the story of St. Helen, mother of Constantine, goes down finds the, the cross that Jesus was, that Jesus died on, along with the other two crosses. So she finds three crosses and, and brings the true cross back to Rome. And so this supposedly has pieces of the true cross in there, which you can see at uh, Santa Croce. Pretty cool. Uh, another thing Santa Maggiore has is this icon painting by uh, St. Luke the, the Evangelist, who is said to have been a painter and in the very tiny center of this altar, you can see the, the icon is of Mary and the baby, which became a, a pretty popular subject uh, during the Renaissance for painters. I'd imagine just because you can kind of maybe do like a small domestic scene with the mother and child and have an artist in there, uh, seems like a pretty safe sort of... Uh, subject matter to do as a painter. Here's uh, the Vasari version of him at the at the easel. Uh, another thing is about St. Luke is that he's always, his attribute is the bovine. So you can see the bovine is over here and this other painting down here in the corner. The Miracle of the Snow is associated with uh, Santa Maria Maggiore. It was said to have been founded on a hill, on Escaline Hill, and the story goes that uh, the patrician, John, so a wealthy man, and, and his wife wanted to devote their, their riches. They didn't have any kids. They wanted to devote their riches to the church or, or do something, you know, in the name of God. And so he had a dream, and in that dream, Mary came to him and said that she will send him a sign and anyways, the next day or following days, sometime in August, like a snow fell up on the Escaline Hill, right? Which is pretty rare because uh, it's summer. And the, and anyways, the snow fell there and they took this as the sign that he was supposed to build a church on this spot. And so here in the painting here, we've got, um, I'm not sure who did this, but um, we've got the Pope kind of uh, marking the plan of the church to kind of denoting or where this church is to be built with his little shovel thing there. And you can see like the snow is falling in like this perfectly uh, mapped out plan view of where the church is gonna be. This is a Perugino painting who was Raphael's teacher, very small. 
We have a, a Mazzolino painting of the Miracle of the Snow as well. And there he is. <laughs> Just how the snow falls in that perfect little plan view is really fantastic. And, and Mazzolino was a student of Masaccio, uh, early 15th century, 14th century. Um, and so anyways, just to kind of go back to the drawing real quick um, about some of the figure groupings. This figure grouping kind of talks about the relics of the manger. Here you have two bandits who maybe stole these relics from wherever they were or brought them from a foreign land. And three worshipers um, knowing that these are the relics of the manger. We have this character over here who's pulling kind of a small painting out of his jacket. This is supposedly supposed to remind me of St. Luke the Evangelist, the painter, uh, pulling the small icon out of his painting. And there he is with the bovine. Um, the Miracle of the, of the Snow, we have these two characters. One is holding the bag of uh, rose petals. They, to celebrate the miracle every, I guess it would be every August, they have this sort of little celebration where they'll drop white rose petals from the ceiling of the church um, to kind of remember the story. Um, and then back here, they're carrying a, a dead body into the church. Uh, Bernini is buried there. And there's also supposedly remains of St. Jerome that are there as well, which are probably hidden, but you can see Bernini's tomb there. Um, moving on, so Mazzolino, right, uh, student of Masaccio, he painted this chapel in San Clemente. This is uh, the St. Catherine Chapel, I guess you would call it. Uh, it starts off with the Annunciation at the top. Then uh, inside to the left, we have the legend of St. Catherine. Um, I always look at these old paintings and I just don't know what they're all about. And so I was just really enthralled with starting trying to learn the stories. And uh, St. Catherine, we have here, uh, the first scene here, uh, challenged to Emperor Maxentius, who was demanding that all should offer sacrifice to idols. Standing alone before the door of the temple, she held a long dispute with the emperor about the incarnation of the Son of God. The scene is set inside like this circular temple, similar to that of the Pantheon. People caught around to listen. This is the conversion of the orators, right? So the emperor got together all of these learned men to try to refute her arguments. And in doing so, she actually eventually uh, persuaded them and converted them all to Christianity. And in the back panel here, you can see all of them being burned alive by order of the emperor and St. Catherine kind of standing in this very sort of calm pose here. And, you can, and at this time, they're very into perspective. So you can kind of see how they even just don't even bother getting rid of the grid. They just sort of leave it in there. Um, uh, third scene, St. Catherine is in jail, visited by the uh, Empress, who herself gets converted to Christianity. And guess what happens to her? That's right. That's her here. Uh, no more head. She's, she's done. Emperor has enough. There he is in his little perch up there. And St. Catherine is sent, sentenced to death. She was is supposed to be torn apart by these uh, you know, revolving wheels. Um, and then, of course, an angel came, comes down and save her, saves her. So this is kind of like the main scene of St. Catherine's life that you see, see in a lot of paintings. Uh, final scene, the death blow. There his, her soul is being carried to heaven and up to the mountain. Um, one cool thing, perspective thing here, we've got, for all of you in perspective class, we've got the orthogonals of this panel going to the central vanishing point here. And this serves also as a diagonal vanishing point for the grid on this side, right? So the abstract rules of perspective sort of kind of unite uh, the panel or the bay, anyways. 
Uh, it's another St. Catherine, just to kind of give you an idea of how she's depicted in, in art. This is in uh, Florence. You can see it at the uh, Santa Maria Novella. Pretty epic scene, I'd say. It's a northern take on the scene. I think this is a, a Tintoretto. And a, a Guercino offering. Uh, you also see her in prison. So she's always holding the martyr's palm. And then you're going to see the little wheel by her if she's sort of kind of like just a single fig. Raphael version with her left arm on the, on the wheel. Um, I was walking around Rome one night, right? And I walked by this little um, antique. Uh, and they have these little antique stores all over the place. And you go on there, it's su super nice. And the antique stores are maybe a little different than here. They're sort of like little museums, or at least to me, I'm looking for these old master paintings. And you, they go in these little stores, and they're like kind of like mini museums. Anyways, I, I, went, I looked in this little window, and this, there were all these little paintings in there. And like a silly American, I just kind of barged my way in there. Like I, like I belong there or something like that. Anyways, this guy was sitting at the easel and he was working on this little painting. He was a restorer, right? So this is the mystic marriage of St. Catherine. Anyways, he was restoring this uh, Nibley Karachi painting, which I, I thought was just amazing. At first I thought he was painting it and I was like, oh my gosh, w what is your name? Um, told me he was a restorer. And, uh, but it was pretty amazing to see up close, like this really cool master painting was probably has forever been in a private collection and you're probably never going to see it again um, uh, on, on copper. Anyways, uh, just a pretty cool thing that happened. Yes, ma'am. Um, the architectural piece, just talk a little bit about that. Uh, as you know, I'm kind of into that. This is a, would be considered a capriccio by Marco Ricci. But the architectural piece sort of came into its own during kind of the 17th, 17th century. Um, it was a minor genre along with still life or landscape or genre painting or maybe the battle piece. Um, but architectural painting kind of started off as being very decorative, right? It was sort of just a background to monum monumental painting. It was often sort of just a frame um, in the Renaissance and, and a little bit after. It was kind of more illusionistic, like bringing you really into the space. And then eventually, it's it kind of got brought to the easel. Um, here's sort of a decorative take on it. This is at the Corsini in Rome. How you would just kind of use it to like fill really tall and skinny spaces, or really short and narrow spaces. But you can you can fit it sort of into anywhere, which is why it lends itself really well to the decorative genre. Um, these would be considered capriccios. So Marco Ricci mainly did um, just sort of invented scenes, right? So all the architecture is not real. It's made up. It's based off of uh, classical designs. And he also did his own figures. A lot of these guys uh, would just do backgrounds and then they would have a figure painter kind of come in and do uh, the figures. But he does a really good job of sort of integrating everything. He has great light effect, uh, great original compositional ideas. Um, and your eye is really just kind of moving around the picture, picture at all times. And can also kind of create a, a really great mood here. Um, is 18th century. And one more here. Another artist I got to copy was uh, Viviana Cadazzi. Um, similar style. He he was one who only did the architecture, right? And he would have someone else do the figures. But the figures would often, and often in, the, in these paintings, the figures are just staffage, right? They're just there to sort of like populate the scene. If you're painting architecture by itself, it just tends to read as fact, right? Like this is a building that exists. Um, but with the figures there, then it can kind of be in its own other world. 
Um, and this is the, a detail of the copy I did. Um, sort of this broken triumphal arch here with an N. Um, uh, characters done by someone else. I only managed to get one figure in there. So I probably spent, you know, maybe four days at the museum copying this. Uh, it's an old St. Peter's. This is Kadazi as well. It's a more maybe topographical piece where it's kind of painting the actual thing and what it most likely would have looked like if you were there. I got tons of slides. Let me keep moving here. Uh, this is uh, Hubert Robert, so another artist of the genre, 18th century as well. Very romantic, right? It's a, a view of the Colosseum. And also we can see Piranesi's take on it. A little bit different, more grand, a little bit more epic, a little more daunting, like the high contrast. And this is a uh, Kadazi's version of it. Here we have the Arch of Constantine and the Colosseum. So this is a, another maybe more topographical view or something that you would see, almost a scene you would see as if you're kind of maybe walking by or something like that. Um, now Kadasi is not really written about very much, but anyways, the American Academy has this fantastic library and, and there's a scholar, um, David Marshall. Anyways, I found this little snippet about how he did this quadratura painting in Santa Maria Violata. And so I set off to go see that. This is Santa Maria Violata. It's a fifth, fifth or it was built on a fifth century Christian oratory, renovated in the 17th century. You can see it's very Baroque. The facade was designed by Cortona. Here's a Giuseppe Vasi engraving. One thing to note is the Serliana here. So this little kind of facade. Um, which is like this tripart, tripartite window, door, or blind architectural feature consisting of a central panel opening with a semicircular arch over it, springing from two entablatures, each supported by two columns flanking narrow or flat topped openings on either side. But, so this is like the exterior design that was also kind of replicated with the interior. So the Kadazi painting, here's the nave of the same church. And up here, is the quadratura painting. Now this is a flat panel, right? And usually here, there's gonna be a dome. This is kind of where the transept would have been. Um, the economical solution to that is to just have a fictive dome or a fictive opening, right? So here um, is the flat painting. A little hard to see. Uh, one thing about these churches is that the lighting is Super awful. You're never going to get a good, good photo. This thing was never open during the day. If you go there at night, it's like pitch black. You can't really see it anyways. Um, but in here, right, so here we've got, uh, there's sort of like a little Serliana in here, right? So here's like the larger arch here with the kind of smaller columns on the side, smaller columns on this side. And again, he's kind of repeating the theme uh, uh, or the design that was on the exterior inside the church, kind of creating that nice sense of, sort of unity. Uh, here's another look at it from the side. And below the church, it's this little sort of like underground dwelling, which St. Paul is said to have lived here while he was awaiting trial for several years. But Rome is like that. Like you go into a lot in the basement of a lot of these places and you're going to see the old world that's that's still alive there and they're just sort of like building it on top like but it's always about the levels right uh so giuseppe vasi we have the trevi fountain in the back here this is santa maria and trivia right so this is one church that i spent a little bit of time in as well and this is what it looks like in the scene here a uh, really small single nave church. It's kind of hidden and out of the way. So most people do not know about it here. So I'll just get the scale. Here I am sitting in the back, looking up at the ceiling. So not very far away, which is nice. And if you're going to paint something on the ceiling, basically you're just going to have to be looking up. Your neck is going to hurt. It's going to be very awful. So here I'm holding my little canvas and my palette and just looking up for hours at, hours at a time. 
Um, this is the scene here. It's uh, scenes in the life of Mary, right? So the first scene here is the presentation of the Virgin. We have the Assumption. And actually, I think this is a circumcision scission of Jesus or the Nativity. I can't remember. Um, so here's uh, just a color study that I did of the, of the first panel there. And uh, it has a very kind of strong triangular composition, which is something that I had in my mind since I maybe spent three or four days working on the color study. This is a, a Veronese painting that I saw when I was in Venice. Uh, it's also on the ceiling, very similar composition. Um, lends itself well to the ceiling. Here's where it is on the ceiling. It's nice. But uh, pretty similar. We're having the stairs riding up to this column, figures kind of spilling out in front of it. Uh, here's a presentation of the Virgin by Titian at the Academia. Kind of, even though this isn't on the ceiling, it sort of has a similar composition, the stairs riding up here to the priest and Mary ascending the stairs, being given to the temple. It's a Giotto version. And a Barocci presentation of the temple, which you can also see in Rome. Very nice. Um, and the central panel here, the oculus, is the assumption. So I had a, such a great time looking at the ceiling, I decided I'd head back there. Um, but there, yeah, there's this nice kind of tromploid architecture that's happening here. And it's the central panel of the of the nave here, right? And so the oculus is in the center of the church, right? It's a very fitting solution to where it is in, in its context. And there you can see Mary sort of rising out of there in, into the heavens here. Uh, we've got Titian version, as you can see in Venice. This painting is gigantic. And an older, early Renaissance painting from the uh, Santa Maria del, del Popolo. Uh, Pinchuccio painted that one. This is a uh, chapel of St. Sylvester. Actually, this is for everyone, everyone going to Michael's talk. This is um, a cool chapel to see as we were talking about uh, Constantine, right? So this kind of tells a story of Constantine getting leprosy, going off to find Pope Sylvester because of a dream he had. Um, anyways, it's this wonderful uh, 13th century fresco that is just very well intact, which is which is pretty rare to see. And here we have St. Sylvester returning to Rome and the power being instilled back to the church. Um, and this, is, this here is a cosmetesque floor, which you see in a lot of uh, sacred buildings, churches, temples, this and that. Um, all right, now we're going to talk a little bit about Mithraism, right? And this, this is kind of the last segment of my talk here. But as you know, it's kind of been permeating my work ever since uh, maybe a year ago or something, ever since this, this first picture. So this is the first I've ever heard of a Mithraeum or what is Mithras? What is this all about? But we did this tour with the American Academy and the director, Kim Bose, actually, she brought us down. She brought us to this church called San Stefano Rotundo. And in this sort of like dark, dingy basement cellar, there was this preserved area, which was a Mithraeum, right? And I'm in this area looking at what you see here. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I don't, I don't know what, what that is. Nobody knew what that was, right? So I didn't think too much of it, right? Here's a painting of Luna on the wall. And a lot of these places are sort of like that where you really have to use your imagination or you really have to kind of know what you're getting into before you before you kind of go down there. And then later on, walking around Rome and seeing other places, this is uh, San Clemente, right? So uh, you remember the Mausolino Chapel of St. Catherine? Oh, this is two floors below that church, right? So this is another Mithraeum, which was 
um, around the second century or something like that. Um, a repurposed for the, uh, the cult of Mithras. This is where they have their little temple. And I'm starting to see like this Mithraism thing kind of happen around Rome a little bit more often. And the altar in the middle shows this god riding a bull with his cloak flowing in the breeze. Um, then I go to the Vatican and we have Mithras here. Again, this is a, a second century sculpture, but heavily restored during the Renaissance. It totally looks, looks like that as well. And so after three months in Rome, we, we moved to Florence and I had the studio and I really had like all this creative energy. I wanted to get it out. I ended up doing this painting, um, which was here last year. Many of you got to see it. Um, so this is sort of a Capriccio with Mithraic ruins. And so it's kind of combining my love of Capriccios with my new found interest in Mithraism and, and the Mithraic cult. Um, kind of talks about the layers of Rome. We have this cosmetesque floor that reveals this other level where we have the Mithras riding the bull, this little fragment that was kind of taken out of the underground here, which is below Lady Roma. Um, there are a lot of parallels with Mithraism and Christianity. So appears a panel uh, depicting Moses striking the rock. There's a similar story of Mithraism where uh, Mithras strikes the rock. Um, so this is sort of kind of my take on the first three months I spent in Italy and just trying to absorb everything. Um, but I didn't know too much about the cult at first, right? So here's a little reconstruction of kind of what it might have been. Um, but Mithraism, it's, it's a mystery religion, right? It came up in the, in the first century exactly at the same time Christianity has. Um, it maintains strict secrecy of its teachings and rituals, revealing them only to initiates, right? So you were promised sort of life after death and how to get to the afterworld, the sphere of the stars is, what, is where you're trying to get. And Mithraism sort of offered that, right? And if you were initiate, you would kind of learn the secrets, but it's, you know, very secretive, which is where the word mystery religion comes from. And they worship in the Mithraeum. This is the typical myth Mithraeum was a small rectangular uh, kind of chambers with a central aisle going down the middle, often with a vaulted ceiling and uh, two aisles running on either side or an aisle running down the middle, sorry, and then two benches on either side where they're kind of two or three feet off the ground. And this is where initiates would lie down and do their dining or and their weird rituals, whatever they did there. Um, this is an Ostia, um, which is maybe 20 minutes outside of Rome. It, it was a port town, but and if you go to Ostia, there's dozens of Mithraeum. Uh, another sort of example, you know, underground, Barrel vaulted room, benches on the side. And at the end, you always found the cult image, right? So this is Mithras slaying the bull, which is another thing for not Ostia. You can see they all they all look a little bit different. They're always kind of reusing old old buildings or kind of making their own. This is the main cult image, uh, which is called the Tarochtony, right, or, or the bull slaying. Right? It's most often a carved relief or a fresco painting or a sculpture. Here we have a sculpture that's also an astia or a fresco painting or a relief here. And what's always present is Mithras slaying the bull. He's accompanied by a dog, a snake a scorpion, and a raven, often with Sol and Luna accompanying him, and often with the torchbearers here. But I learned that the cult was very much about astrology, right, and the cosmos, right? And, and at this time, uh, first century Greco-Roman world, they had a geocentric view of the, of the universe, right? So where the earth was stationary, but then the celestial sphere would rotate right and so that's how they sort of dealt with that right first now is a heliocentric version where we're revolving around the sun 
before everything else was revolving around the earth and had this cool diagram hold on so this is sort of kind of the celestial sphere like the large globe so it's earth in the middle the very large sphere is the celestial globe which is basically or the celestial sphere which is basically imagine looking out into space right and just as far as you can see you're just imagining like all the blackness and the stars are affixed to the sphere that's just totally surrounding the earth and that gives us um, two things here we have the celestial equator right so you can imagine a disk emanating from the earth and the rotation of the sun so the sun kind of moves along with the as a celestial sphere rotates the earth that gets giving us night and day the sun is also rotating as well and then throughout the course of the year the sun goes around this ecliptic which is also known as the zodiac right you guys all know the zodiac um, but what's important to note is that on the spring equinox the ecliptic is going to hit the celestial equator here at a certain uh, zodiacal constellation right so here it's hitting it at Taurus right and as it hits Taurus it's also hitting it at Scorpius which is going to be the autumn equinox and along this celestial sphere it's also hitting uh, Canis Minor, Hydra, Corvus so symbols for the dog the snake and the raven as well Taurus would be the bull Scorpion, Scorpio would be the scorpion and so now after sort of learning this, I'm looking at the Troctony and the Cult of Mithras as being like sort of this other thing, right? It's, they're very much about the stars, much like all ancient peoples were, right? That's sort of like your explanation for how to get into the afterlife. And here's uh, a little sculpture. This ring here contains uh, signs of the Zodiac. This is Mithras in the center. He's holding the celestial globe. With his other hand, he's moving uh, moving the zodiac and you guys ever heard of the oh the age of Aquarius right you know there's a cool song that goes with it but supposedly we're moving into the age of Aquarius right now we're in the age of Pisces and at the time of the cult or the first century it was in the age of Aries right which basically meant that when the ecliptic hits the uh, celestial equator that's at Aries so you're sort of in the age of Aries but before Mithraism it was the age of Taurus, right? Which is important for the myth because this was a discovery sort of made in the first century or first century BC, right? And so this is sort of what they knew before, right? You're in the age of Taurus. But all of a sudden in the first century BC, there was a discovery that it's no longer the age of Taurus. Like we're now moving into the age of Aries. And so their whole sort of geocentric or, or uh, cosmological worldview kind of was shook, was shaken, right? Was shook. And so it's the end of the age of Taurus and moving into a different age. And so that's kind of what this is all about, right? So Mithras is like kind of the cosmic god. He's taking down the bull, kind of signifying, signifying the end of the age of Taurus and moving into a new age. So here we have the zodiac around here. Of course, the usual characters involved in, ter in the Tarachtony. Um, this is one that you can actually see in New York right now. It's... Uh, there's a Time and Cosmos exhibition, uh, but it's a, it's a panel here. We have the usual characters. And these are the signs of the Zodiac. Here's the Taurus and here's the Aries. They're sort of looking different ways, kind of signifying the change in, in the epoch. These are the signs of the Zodiac out here. Sol, Luna, and uh, personifications of spring summer, winter, and autumn. Another Tarachtony here. Um, more Mithraeum. I'll spare you the, I'll spare you some of this. Um, cool thing about the Mithraeum is, or at least this one here, this one has signs of the zodiac that are still able to see, right? So here we've got on the flat part of the bench, signs of the zodiac going this way and this way on the vertical part of the bench we have the planets and so this is all the mithraeum is designed it's supposed to be like a microcosm of the entire universe right and so all this symbolism and 
the location, like within the Mithraeum, is sort of designed to when you enter it, you are in like you are in the universe, right? So Mithraeum, they never have any sort of exterior, right? It's it's always interior, sort of like when you're in the universe, there is no exterior to the universe, right? You're just in it, and and that's and that's all that there is. Right? Uh, rock birth. It's another kind of part of the cults, cult image that you'll see around. Um, what else we got here? Oh, the banquet. So the banquet of Mithras and Sol. This is a pretty cool panel here showing uh, Mithras, Sol, two torchbearers here. The blood of the bull soaking the ground below the altar. Here he's holding the caduceus. There's a symbol of Mercury, who was a psychopomp, which means uh, creatures, spirits, or deities whose responsibility it is to escort newly descended souls from Earth to the afterlife in order to provide safe passage, right? So the whole thing with Mithraism is that your, your soul descends to the Earth, and then you get initiated, and then you learn the knowledge that you need to know in order to like ascend out into the sphere, the celestial sphere of the fixed stars once again. Uh, here's a little banquet scene, and this is the evidence to show that um, you can kind of see in the painting I'm working on over there. Some of the characters are ho are wearing little masks there, right? and here's a spirited um, reconstruction of sort of what it might have been in a Mithraeum at the time. I, I don't know. This is sort of a little goofy looking, but you can see they're wearing these little animal costumes and dancing around, having fun. Um, and actually, that's the end. So, um, well, anyways, thanks. <laughs> anyways, I hope you saw a bunch of stuff that you've never seen before. Uh, that was sort of the goal here. And yeah, if you have any questions or anything, I'm around. Any questions now? Yeah, they would do, yeah, probably like, like most any other cult. But yeah, there were little sacrifices. Um, you would often find kind of chicken bones or small animal bones. Um, you hear a lot about like how they would get like a bull and slay it and people would, they would drip the blood on the people and they would just kind of get really into it, get really into the zone. I don't really read too much about that. I imagine it was mostly kind of smaller animals they would sacrifice um, during their little ritual meals and, and this and that. All right. Anyone else? Good. Yeah, go ahead. You know what? As a painter, I think what I want to paint is I want to paint stories that haven't been painted before. I mean, I also like the idea of kind of painting things that have been painted before and kind of continuing these stories. But I also really like the idea of like kind of finding new myths and new stories to kind of tell. And Mithraism... I'm surprised I've never seen any painting about it. You know, no, it is very old. It's from the first century, first to third century, but there aren't there aren't any depictions of it at all in painting um, or sculpture or anything after after it dissolved um, in the fourth century. And so, and it also had like all these great images, right? There's snakes, there's dogs, there's scorpions, there's sacrifice. Um, it has to deal with astrology, um, and so it has like all these elements that. It's just it's perfect for painting. I also think um, painting is sort of like kind of an antiquated medium a little bit, or at least kind of the view of it today where, oh, you're a traditional painter. Well, that's nice. That's an old sort of thing. So I think it's like an, a, a nice medium to use to kind of tell old stories, right? It's an old medium. You can tell an old story. And so I think Mithraism is the perfect um, subject matter for painting, actually. Um, Anyways, that's sort of something I've been coming to find out. But just originally, it was, I've never heard about it. And so I want to learn more about it. And a lot of kind of the work that I do is just um, an extension of things that I'm interested in, things that I'm already going to be researching anyways. So I'm just going to try to incorporate it in the painting. And um, I just got into it and continue to kind of learn a lot, a lot about it. Thank you for coming. Yes.